From New York City, for our viewers worldwide, I'm Katie Greifeld. Bloomberg Real Yield starts right now. Coming up, a hawkish Fed sends Treasury yields surging to cycle highs, erasing high-grade bonds 2023 gains in the process, all as a, the U.S. government hurdles towards a shutdown deadline. We begin with the big issue, a whole new world. We've seen the sort of precipitous rise in yields in a very short amount of time. These very rapid moves. Long end yields are likely to move higher. Head towards 5%. Bond yields are backing up. It's not shocking to me that um, 10 year yields are, are finally kind of increasing. The dynamics in the bond market are definitely uh, changing. I think there's a little bit of supply demand dynamics going on with treasuries. Once bond yields have peaked, which we think we're getting closer. At these levels, fixed income does look attractive. Bond market seems be testing the Fed's resolve. You could get into a situation where the Fed's essentially lost control of the back end of the curve. Higher yields and you have concerns about a growth slowdown. Really hard to know where we go from here. It's a new world. Joining us now, Bank of America's Matt Dizok and RBC's Blake Gwynn. And Matt, let's start there. A new world. Is this a new regime that we've entered into? Uh, yes, finally, um, the Fed is having uh, a, a communication platform that's actually correct, as opposed to what they told us for the past two years, where they were continually behind the curve, continually trying to play catch up and, and then communicate to the market and, and, and get uh, behind and then get ahead of themselves. They've done a very good job now of getting in front of the market and continuing to talk hawkish to the market to get the market to do the work for them. Uh, Chair Bernanke had a great, uh, great quip that he said central banking is 98 percent talk and the Fed's doing a good job now of talking the right way, trying to convince the market there's another hike. But more importantly, trying to convince the market that rates are likely to stay higher for longer. And the market is internalizing that message. To be honest with you, the market is not concerned about another Fed rate hike this cycle. Um, it only has about a one third chance the Fed's going to hike uh, either in November uh, of December or January. But if you look at the Fed Fund's futures curve longer term, over the next 10 years, the market is now estimating the Fed Fund's rates to be 4.5%. So the Fed's doing a good job. Continue to talk hawkish. Continue to convince the market rates could be higher for longer because it is much easier from a risk management perspective to ease and bring back those rate expectations than it is to continually try to play catch up. So this is the right communication strategy from our perspective. And Blake, a lot of people saw the dot plot last week. A lot of people heard what Jerome Powell was saying and took that to mean higher for longer. And that's what you've seen play out across the bond market, particularly in the long end of the curve. But I'm taking a look at your notes, and it seems that you weren't too impressed by any shifts that we saw in the dot plot last week. Yeah, I, look, I mean, I mean, for me, if I look at the entirety of the sell-off we've had since July, I think there you can draw a little bit more of a story about this soft landing, hawkish Fed. I think if I really look at the last week, when we've seen this last kind of leg to, to these new highs all across the yield curve, to me, that's a little bit less about the Fed. I mean, the Fed pricing in the near term has been very stable. And I think what we've seen is the back end really leading the sell-off. And to me, it's really more about um, a lack of buyers. Um, I think this term premium story is weighing on people. Uh, I do think the higher for longer acceptance really means that to have a long position, you have to accept negative carry, uh, these kind of painful positions, uh, uh, painful carry for holding these positions. Um, that's likely to persist for a longer period of time. And I think a lot of people who would have been buyers here already got long. Mm. You know, they got long when 10 year yields were 390, 410 um, percent. And in that case, there's not really a whole lot you can do here except look at the prices go higher and wish that you would have waited, but you can't create dry powder to buy these yields if you already kind of spent that powder uh, when we were back down at 394, 10%. So I think we've just got this uh, confluence of events that's really keeping buyers on the sideline, and that's what's really um, allowing yields to move so much higher. I don't really see what's happened in the last week as, as really like a Fed play or a view on a reacceleration or higher inflation or anything like that. Well, with these uh, kind of price moves that we've seen, these kind of yield moves that we've seen, obviously we have a lot of heavyweights weighing in on where the ceiling for interest rates might be. That includes Larry Fink of BlackRock. Let's take a listen to what he had to say. My opinion <laughs> is we're going to have 10-year rates at least at 5% or higher. Um, 
because of this embedded inflation, this structural inflation is unlike anything. And, and I think business leaders and politicians are not providing uh, the foundation to help explain this. We have not seen inflation like this in over 30 years. And man, it was interesting to hear him say that because that's what I've been looking for all week, really, sort of the driver behind what we're seeing at the long end. Larry Fink seems to think it's this structural change in inflation. Do you see a similar structural change in the inflation environment? And does that mean structurally higher interest rates? So there certainly is a chance once you let the inflation genie out of the bottle, that you have trouble containing it. And the history of inflation spikes tells you that it's not usually one spike, it's usually two or three spikes. We don't have a lot of high inflation episodes in the US. We have the 1970s and we have World War II. In both those instances, you didn't see inflation spike once or twice, you saw them spike three times. So historically speaking, the majority of the time, once you have high inflation, it does tend to be a little more difficult to control and you do have multiple spikes. That being said, um, the market does not seem to be concerned about that. You can make arguments that tips are not that liquid, they're not the best barometer, but they are the barometer we have. Whether it's one year, five year, 10 year, 20 year, 30 years, the entire tips break even curve is telling you that inflation is not going to be a problem. Once you adjust for PCE, it looks like the market is saying the Fed's gonna have no trouble hitting that inflation target over any time frame. So we have to take a step back and look at that. If that's really the market's view, then maybe we don't have to be as concerned with structurally higher inflation, but it's certainly an open question. And it is historically informed that, again, you have multiple inflation spikes. So then you have to look at where is value right now? Where are real rates right now? And to our opinion, real rates are not high enough in that 3 to 4% range. They would structurally take care of that uh, regime shift to higher inflation. But they're absolutely at a level that they're reasonable to good. Mm. And if you go back to a normal uh, real rate environment that's lower, they look very attractive. So on balance, we still favor being slightly long duration here. We think the market is internalizing and pricing in uh, more risk than we think is necessary. And we'll definitely get to that uh, duration discussion. But Matt makes a good point that you take a look at what's actually priced in in terms of uh, inflation expectations, Blake. Market doesn't seem too concerned about getting back to a 2% target. When you think about what it would actually take to get to a 5% level on nominal 10-year Treasury yields, what would it take? Would it take those inflation expectations becoming unanchored? I mean, I think that's one way to get there. But, um, you know, we're kind of beyond any real technical level. And like I said before, I think there's still this big concern about term premium out there. Right now, I think the biggest upside risk to yields that I'm concerned about is actually on the term premium side, not on the reacceleration of inflation or Fed having to hike more, or having to hold rates higher for longer. That almost seems like a conversation that, that settled down um, you know, a month ago. And, and now this term premium thing since the August Treasury refunding announcement, which is where um, you know, they surprised a lot of people with how much they were announcing on the deficit, really got this conversation going again. Um, but over that time period, I've shifted to think that if we are moving to that 5% range, it's much more likely to be on the back of what the supply of, of uh, what treasury supply means, you know, who's going to buy that supply and really more of this kind of term premium idea, then, you know, we're going to see inflation, um, you know, continue to stick up. We've actually had very positive data on inflation, which kind mm -hmm. of it's interesting to me that we're kind of having this conversation again um, about higher inflation. I think it's been emboldened by the fact that yields have been selling off. But the data we've had over the last two or three months, in my view, is very positive for inflation continuing to soften. Yeah, we got more of that today uh, in those PCE figures. But I'm glad you brought up the refunding announcement because I know that was a surprise. But you think about the Treasury market. It feels like supply, we talk about it sometimes when there's a bad auction, et cetera. But does supply truly matter in this market? Does that explain the 50 basis points rise that we've seen in September? Look, I mean, we can do a lot of analysis on what, um, you know, what the pass through should actually be, um, you know, go back and do regressions and things on prior times when we've had uh, supply coming online. But I would say this, I was um, in Canada all last week doing client meetings. Um, this question of who's going to buy the debt came up in almost every single meeting. So it is weighing on investors' minds. And I think it's very hard, again, to these dip buyers and who would actually step in, buy these yields, get long. 
a lot of those people are worried about this 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 term premium issue, which you know really at its heart is a question about supply and who's going to buy that supply. So um, I think it, I certainly think it's 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 real. Um, it's worth something, and certainly at this point we've priced a lot of that in since August. But I think still that provides a, a lot of upside risk to yields here. Well, Matt, weigh in on that. Are you concerned about who the natural buyer is? We're not concerned about who the natural buyer is. We, we, we assume that there are plenty of people who find real rates at two and a quarter, two and a half percent real across the curve. Again, if we were talking you know, two years ago, Katie, a five-year real yields were negative two percent. For the privilege of owning a Treasury inflation index security, you could lose two percent of your wealth every single year. Now we're talking, and real rates are 2.5% to the positive. No credit risk. Sit back. Grow your real wealth by 2.5% per year. That is a good to reasonable rate if we're structurally higher inflation. If we're not, it is a very attractive rate in our opinion. We believe there are a lot of pension funds, long-duration buyers, people defeasing liabilities that will like this real rate environment. So we are not concerned about finding buyers. Can technicals and supply in the short term drive rates? Absolutely. Over the long term, will technicals drive rates? They will not. It will be fundamentals. It will be valuations. It will be inflation. It will be nominal and real growth. Those will be the driver of rates, not technical. So taking advantage of slightly higher nominal yields and higher real yields makes, uh, makes sense in our opinion. And guys, and the, the question of term premium, yeah. historically, that's a very fair point that Blake's making. That's one of the things we have as an eye to potentially higher rates. On average, you know, the last 50, mm -hmm. 60 years, the spread between the Fed funds rate and the 10 year average is about 100 basis points. Obviously, mm -hmm. it cycles, it gets inverted, but the average is 100. So, again, if the market is correct and the average Fed funds rate of the next decade is four and a half, you could certainly see a structurally higher 5% plus 10 year. That would be consistent if, again, if that market expectation for the Fed funds rate at mid fours is correct. All right. Uh, it, I just looked at the clock. Time is flying. This block really flew by. Really appreciate your time today. We didn't even get to the government shutdown. We'll have to do that next time. Matt Dizak and Blake Wynn, thank you both so much for your time on this very rainy Friday in New York. Up next, the auction block, where Citibank taps the bond market with its first bank-level debt offering in years. This is Real Yield on Bloomberg. I'm Katie Greifeld. This is Bloomberg Real Yield. Time now for the auction block. Where after a chilly start to the week, the action picked up in high-grade sales. Weekly volume was more than $18 billion, while September hit $124 billion. Citibank pushing those numbers higher this week with a $5 billion sale of fixed and floating rate notes. Meanwhile, junk borrowers are taking advantage of strong investor appetite, bringing riskier offerings to the leveraged loan market. One of them was wedding planning site The Knot, which had a $765 million sale. And global corporations are buying back bonds at the slowest pace since 2009, a likely sign that they're waiting to refinance, though the delay could come back to haunt them as maturities pile up and rates stay higher for longer. And speaking of leverage loan, BlackRock's Amanda Lynham says loans are likely the most exposed to economic headwinds. If you just take the three broad buckets of leverage loans, high yield bonds and investment grade bonds, arguably leverage loans are in the weakest vulnerable fundamental position because they've been contending with this higher borrowing cost for the past several quarters, really since early 2022. But they've had the best performance year to date. Um, we don't think that that is sustainable over the long term. Joining us now, I'm thrilled to say we have Invesco's Matt Brill and Kelly Burton of Bearings. And Kelly, I'll, sh I'll start with you because what Amanda Lynham was just talking about, we've been talking about all year, that it's been the riskier credits that have been outperforming in 2023. When does that run out of steam? Good question. Yes, here in the world of high yield bonds, triple C's have massively outperformed the rest of the market. They've been up nearly 13% year to date. So we've had a lot of compression in the lower bands of the credit quality spectrum. But what we've really tended to 
like in our asset class has been an up in quality trade. Um, double Bs today, you can get those at seven and a half to eight percent, which we feel like investors really don't have to reach down far in the credit quality spectrum in order to garner some pretty attractive total returns. And Kelly, just to finish that thought, when do you reach down? When is the time to maybe look towards the riskier end of the spectrum? I think as we move into 2024, if we really can get a better sense for how the lagged effects of all the credit tightening that we've seen to date are starting to run through the market, if we can um, start to make sure any signs of potential recession are pushed over uh, further to, to the right, or if there's really no sign of recession to come, uh, I think there's always room to reach for certain triple Cs. And, and we certainly do that here at Bearings. It just has to be on a real credit by credit basis. Um, a lot of idiosyncratic stories reside in that bucket. It's only about 10% of our market right now, which is about half of what it was 10 to 15 years ago. So very different quality of the market than we used to have in high yield. And Matt, bring us to your world of investment grade debt. Is this still an up in quality trade, even in blue chips? Or how are you thinking about that compared to valuations? Yeah, good afternoon, Katie. You know, we think there, there's there's value in the triple Bs or the lower portion of the um, of the market, and you know we feel pretty comfortable that the soft landing is going to happen. Um, I'd say that the rise in rates over the last week or so have have kind of thrown a little bit of a kink into that, but overall we're, we're still on the, pa the the path to a soft landing, we believe. And with that, um, your triple B companies have plenty of incentive to stay at rated investment grade. Um, you know, just the cost to go from triple B to double B is expensive, and anything lower than that, um, you know, really starts to be upper upper single digits. So, you know, if you're an investment grade company, you're going to do everything you can to stay investment grade right now, which we think uh, you know is a nice incentive for them. Uh, but overall, the fundamentals still remain pretty good. So, yeah, we're comfortable down in the in the quality spectrum within the investment grade space. Well, on that point that an investment grade issuer, they're going to do everything they can to keep that investment grade rating. Are they going to be able to do that, though? Well, I, I think it depends on the timing of when the economy slows. So if you if you were to have if you could guarantee me a soft landing, I, I would tell you that this is a really good scenario for owning bonds and particularly investment grade and double B high yield because companies are going to want to pay down debt. It's very expensive to have debt right now. Um, and the EBITDA is there to support it. So um, as of now, we, we think that's fine. Um, as the economy slows, which we, we do think we're on a path to slowing here, um, you know, the, 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 the corporations need to be out in front of that. And I think for the most part, they have been. It's been the obviously the, the most forecasted recession in history. So this shouldn't surprise anybody if and when the economy does slow. So I think that the starting point right now is very good. Um, but as the cost of debt continues to stay high and more and more debt rolls over, you know, it'll be more and more problematic for corporations. But as of right now, if this is a, a, a next six to 18 months type time frame for a slowdown, I, I think they're, they're very well positioned to handle that. Real yield viewers won't be surprised when that recession finally hits. Someone <laughs> will, but hopefully not viewers of this show. I'm already enjoying this conversation because I'm hearing from Matt that maybe you look at some of the lower rated IG issuers. I'm hearing, of course, from Kelly, maybe you look higher quality junk issuers. And I want to ask something uh, to the both of you, because this applies to both investment grade and high yield. The fact that you have yields very high at some of the highest levels in a year at least. And then you take a look at spreads and they're very, very narrow. That's true in high yield. It's true in investment grade. Kelly, I'll come to you first. When you're evaluating your market, are you saying, wow, yields are high. I should lock this in. Are you looking at spreads and saying, wow, that looks rich? Yeah, there's a lot of debate around valuation. But as we walked in today, high yield was sitting right at 9%. And generally, that's been a buy signal for the market over the past year. The other thing really supporting the market is our absolute low dollar prices. So high yield is offering 10 to 15% price discounts. Generally, when we're seeing yields or prices in this context, we have seen um, double digit for 12 month returns. Um, also, when we've been in this price context, that's already been in recessionary environments, which we're clearly not in today. Uh, on the spread story, we're over about 400 basis points on an OAS basis today. Uh, I think, again, part of this goes back to my point before on quality. We've just never really been this high in quality before in the types of companies we have in high yield as well as the rating band. 
And Matt, I'll bring that question to you. When you're looking at IG spreads, again, they look pretty tight to me. You take a look at IG yields. I believe they're at the highest level since October 2022. Which is the bigger signal to you? Which are you paying more attention towards? I think it's all about yield right now. Um, you know, we actually, until the last few days, the higher yields were met with more and more uh, buyers. So um, last time we hit 6%, like you said, October 2022, um, we rallied about 11% in the investment grade market after that. Um, not saying we're going to get that this time, but, you know, just the math gets in your favor. At a certain point here, it gets harder to lose money. You know, it certainly can still be done, but just the math gets better and better for you uh, at these at these higher yield levels. So we look at spreads at 120 and, and you know, on the path uh, to a soft landing at these higher yield levels, there is going to be less supply and better fundamentals or at least good fundamentals. And that drives spreads to, in my opinion, to 80 if you get the soft landing. If you don't, you know, there's, there's that tail risk, which is still re relatively fat right now. If you don't, uh, you know, you're going back to a high 100. So overall, it's probably fair at 120. Um, but if it goes on the path that we're expecting, I think you're going to continue to grind tighter here. All right. It's all about the yield. I think that's a great place to end it. Matt Brill and Kelly Burton, thank you both so much. Great to catch up with you. Have a great weekend. Still ahead on Real Yield, the final spread, the week ahead featuring the U.S. jobs report, maybe, as it could be delayed by a likely U.S. government shutdown. This is Real Yield on Bloomberg. Katie Greifeld, this is Bloomberg Real Yield. Time now for the final spread, the week ahead. Coming up, a potential government shutdown could begin Sunday. Monday, a Bloomberg TV interview with Jamie Dimon at 10 a.m. Eastern. Tuesday, FTX co-founder Sam bakeman frieds tra fraud trial begins. Wednesday, we'll get ADP private payrolls, another round of jobless claims on Thursday. Then on Friday, it's the September jobs report, which could be delayed by a government shutdown. If you take a look at the estimates for what we could get, we'll see. You're expected to see less headline jobs, fewer headline jobs added. The unemployment rate actually ticked down a little bit. Of course, the jobs report may not be the only economic release affected by the shutdown. All of these releases vulnerable, all of them very important, especially when you think about CPI, you think about, of course, retail sales, et cetera. Again, we'll see where we end up and uh, what we're talking about this time next week. But from New York, that does it from us. Same time, same place next week. This is Bloomberg Real Yield, and this is Bloomberg. Bloomberg.